So we got some job security uh, Our vision is a healthy lives in harmony with healthy lands for all tribal nations. Our mission is to uh, partner with and empower Native American, Alaskan Natives to implement locally led projects that develop youth, improve food systems, livelihoods, sustain cultures and traditions, and protect the natural world, which is air, water, soil, forestry, plant, fisheries, and wildlife for generations to come. Uh, and, you know, for us, uh, you know, we're kind of in a unique situation where we operate on federal trust land. So, you know, I, what I tell the tribes is, you know, we got to build our own hybrid tribal conservation districts. Uh, and where we really focus on the youth because uh, there's a little bit of a dis disconnect on tribal lands. I, I forgot the, the statistics for that, but a good chunk of our elders, which are baby boomers right now, uh, there's a disconnect between them and the younger generation. So we're trying to uh, desperately reach out to the younger generation. Uh, we realize, you know, they're in their 18s, their early 20s right now. And it's going to get a, you know, our return on what we're doing now, we're not going to see it for 10 years. So uh, we started a conservation core, uh, a hands-on, you know, get dirty, kind of learn the trade kind of deal, not really sit in the classroom kind of deal. Uh, we're hoping to bridge the generation gap through cultural pro projects, uh, including our tribal elders because our, our, uh, our history is uh, more of an oral history. It's not really written in any book. So it's very important that that history is passed down from the elders to the next generation. And there has been a disconnect there for, uh, I'd say for maybe the last hundred years because we were in survival mode, you know? And so, uh, and we're also wanting to pro prom promote professionalism. <laughs> Um, one thing that we're really pushing is uh, food sovereignty and security, uh, helping to lay the foundation and re revitalize our internal and vertically integrated food system. Uh, we learned firsthand this last couple years that um, you know our, our tribal uh, officials they really uh, were pounding their chest for years, saying how uh, independent and how sovereign we were. And until COVID took place, that was a lesson that we weren't as sovereign and, and individual like we thought we were. We had to ask the feds and the state for assistance. So uh, now is a perfect opportunity to revisit where we're at and do an assessment and, and start with these conservation districts and our traditional practices to revitalize that. And I really think social media has really boosted that in, in our, you know, with the Native Americans because we get to see what other tribes are doing and what they're focusing on and it's really a, gave us a boost. Tribal livelihood, income and, and unemployment. So most of the tribes that we work with, uh, the unemployment 60 to 70 percent unemployment and uh, the income is uh, for the largest tribe in the uh, United States, which is Navajo, the average mean income per tribal member is $9,400 for a tribal member for the year. And so that's what we have to work with. Um, we want to also tie that into the health, well-being, and uh, help them improve their, improve their capacities. Uh, at lunchtime, uh, I sat by a gentleman that asked me, so what's the big difference between tribal and non-tribal, you know, working with both sides? And I told him that, uh, well, for one thing is, we live and we claim federal trust land we don't have any direct ownership of that land. So that means that we cannot derive any uh, collateral to improve a lot of the agriculture or conservation practices that are out there. I know a lot of people drive through our, our federal lands and our tribal lands and they're like, well, why don't these people just help themselves? You know, why, why don't they get out and work? Why don't they buy machinery? They have all this land, they have all this uh, water rights. But if you cannot even get a loan, I, I, I myself, you know, I try to, I try to put in for things myself, and I make pretty decent money, and, and here I can't get a loan because I don't have cap collateral on the land. So if I can't get it, you know, for sure, if you have nine thousand four hundred dollars a year uh, as your annual income, you're not going to get a food. 
so it's a vicious cycle that's just happening and it's getting worse you know and so uh, one way that we're trying to alleviate that with, with this with our organization is to uh, look into private investors because we got the raw resources we just need the capital to make things happen and uh, to my knowledge that hasn't been I, i'm sure it's been looked at in the past but uh, you know we're, we can actually get things done i also sit on the board of uh, a tribal farm that belongs to the Navajo. It's a 110,000 acre farm. We've got close to 700 pivots. And uh, it, it, you know, over COVID, uh, we actually started making quite a bit of money with that farm, just off of our produce and our hay and, you know, corn and things to sell. So you can see that business model working successfully. Uh, Sustain cultures and traditions, sharing a, our trade resources, our elder mentorships, and protect our ceremonial plants and wildlife and harvest of traditional food. And this is where the fire and prescribed burn part blends in with, with what we do, and, and we have a history. It was suppressed, you know? Like I mentioned earlier, we were just in survival mode. <laughs> and so, you know, I, I get this mentioned to me, well, well, you guys claim, you know, traditional ecological knowledge, but a lot of you guys aren't doing it. And it's like, well, you know, we, we, we're still not there yet. You know, if you're making 9400 a year, you're, you're just trying to live paycheck to paycheck if, if you have a paycheck. So, you know, we'll get there. <laughs> we saw it work successful in, in the past in the areas that we live in. A lot of the areas that we live in uh, that you have to understand is it's not our traditional area, some of it. You know, we were put in different areas by the government and said, well, this is your new area, this is your new homeland. So areas that were managed by a lot of the tribes were pretty vast and in other, you know, they encompassed other areas, but the, the government said, well, you're gonna live in Oklahoma, and you're gonna live outside of the Black Hills, and Navajo, you're gonna live uh, beside your traditional area, not toward Arizona, not really, you know, your creation story area. Sustainability, uh, uh, adaption, uh, uh, enhanced resiliency, and reduction of vulnerability. You know, we, those are all words that, uh, you know, we lived it. <laughs> we're, we're still here, we're still existing, no matter, you know, what political forces, what governments, what, you know, everything that's been pushed upon us, we're still, we're still active and we're still living, we're still struggling. But, um, you know, this, uh, I think once we get back to the holistic way of management and the holistic way of thinking that we're taught, I know in Navajo we're taught to live, uh, you know, our elders teach us to live a balanced life. And a balanced life is good and bad. So, uh, and one uh, case that I had, you know, talking with my grandmother, you know, she, she, she was having lunch with her great-grandfather, she remembers as a kid, and there was ants that kept bothering them while they were out there picnicking or whatever. And he told her, you know, break off your food and give it to the, you know, give it to the ants, they'll stop bothering me. And she learned a valuable lesson that day, you know, <laughs> that if she shares a little, you know, then, then they're not going to always attack her. So I thought that was pretty Additional focus is uh, efficient use of our natural resources. And that's kind of very important right now because we do have senior water rights, like at that farm that we have. Uh, we have uh, over 500,000 acre feet of water rights to run that farm. We're using half of it right now. We still have rights to it. But, you know, my concern is that we use it efficiently and, and uh, you know, that, that we're on the up and up with it. We don't just want to, like, bottle it and send it overseas, you know, because uh, that would be, wouldn't be ethical on our part to do that. So. We want to make sure that what resources we have, we use it ethically. Uh, exchanging the value of our resources and balanced system management approach to how we manage our resources. So the purpose is to assist conservation districts, tribal nations with holistic land stewardship, instill traditional knowledge while protecting and restoring the circle of life to heal Mother Earth. Uh, so this is the conservation corps that we started in uh, right before COVID. Our first project was with the Chippewa uh, Cree youth and uh, 18 to 26 years old. 
Uh, we try to focus more on the high risk category, uh, the kids that are, I say, C, D, and F students, because as a lot of you might have experienced, especially when we come from a rural community, you know, the A and B students usually go off to college, they're pretty successful in their endeavors. The ones that get left behind are the CDNF students, and those are like the home people, you know, homeboys or whatever. They stay, they, they stay in that community, you know? So why not uh, invest in them to try to work out something that can work for their benefit, managing our natural resources, and that's what we really promote. So uh, this, this project lasted eight weeks. Uh, they got to work on an ag resource management plan uh, which uh, lacked uh, GPS and GIS mapping. So we just went out and bought them GPS units. We had a guy teach them over a week and they went out and did all the waypoints and it boosted, it accelerated that management plan by three years. It would have took uh, their natural resource person three years to do what those kids did in six or eight weeks. And then uh, we also got some uh, youth corps working with the Hamas uh, Cattle Association north of Albuquerque. And they're putting up electrical, they put up electrical fencing last year. This year they're working on a virtual fencing project next month. So uh, it's pretty neat this technology is starting to, you know, before we, we wouldn't even consider, uh, you know, running cattle in certain areas because we lack the infrastructure, but now you know, the technology is there. Uh, we're going to find out how, you know, how, uh, how uh, reliable it is, though, because you, know, you hear mixed stories with that. Uh, we also had, uh, this year we had our youth corps work on biocontrol projects uh, up in um, Rockaway, Montana. So uh, they worked on, uh, with the APHIS money to get that done. And then again, professionalism and training. So the next step with our youth corps, what I'd like to see is, um, you know, get them uh, red carded. You know, the ones that want to get red carded. So they have the opportunity to do wildland firefighting during the fire season. In the off season, they can focus on prescribed burning. That's that's where I'm going with this. And uh, I'm hoping we can get that implemented in the next two years. Uh, our projects, we work on natural resource management plans, conservation planning. We also started a seed partnership uh, we work on range management unit plans, APHIS emergency management plans, and biocontrol. And then we started doing uh, monthly uh, webinars. Uh, one of them that's coming up is a wild horse issue. Uh, we're going to talk about that on September 6th, I think. Uh, we started the Indigenous Grazing Lands Coalition, a partnership with NAT GLC, uh, brainstorming sessions. Uh, we do outreach uh, with holistic management. They're going to train our uh, employees to do uh, to be certified trainers, so our employees can go out and train you know our farmers and ranchers. And I mentioned the virtual fence project. We started this Southern Plains Stronghold Initiative with the Nature Conservancy, and I got word the other day that we did get some funding out of that for our youth course. So they're going to be working in. Uh, hopefully the panhandle of Oklahoma uh, next year. And then we just started a, a Trading Pathways Act. So back in the day, the tribes used to trade with each other. You know, uh, uh, shells from California ended up in Montana. You know, stuff like that from large distances the tribes used to interact. And so now we're, we're making it possible with the phone app that they can still do that trading. You know, it doesn't have to trade, you don't have to trade money, you know. Uh, last year we facilitated a trade uh, where one of the Oklahoma tribes sent hay up to Montana. And I don't know if they've gotten a return, but um, we're, we're starting to, to get that kicked off this year. And then we also uh, did some, uh, so we're starting new projects with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife. Assisting the formation of a Native Livestock Association and Native uh, American Beef product. That's kind of where my heart's at. That's something that I've been working on for 10 years now. And it's just now starting to build momentum. So I'm hoping that, you know, with all of our, everything that we're learning with prescribed burning, rotational uh, grazing, virtual fencing, all that will give us a strong foundation to have a sustainable product that we can uh, we can offer out to the um, 
I guess to the to the nation, maybe even the world. But uh, that's a goal. Uh, conservation districts. We uh, we work with the leader, tribal leaders, farmers, ranchers, uh, and they increase their independence because they are completely solely. Yeah. One of the guys that works for me redid some of these sites. It sounds like he's going in circles, but go ahead. So our strategic plan and goals for the future is to facilitate the creation of tribal conservation districts. Uh, and I like to throw in hybrid because we need to make them more up to date and assist uh, conservation districts become functional, independent. Uh, conservation increase uh, building capacity within the lives of the tribe and cultivate the next generation of farmers, ranchers, conservationists and revitalize our traditional ecological knowledge to manage our tribal resources. And this is a picture of um, Smoky Valley Ranch that I worked for at one time, the Nature Conservancy. So uh, that is kind of a, I, I, I like that. <laughs> and then this is, uh, this is uh, one of our meetings in Tulsa, Oklahoma. It's me in the background. This is a tribal liaison. This is the head of the BIA, the head of uh, USDA. Uh, the FSA administrator and then the head of NRCS. Uh, and we got at, I got the question earlier, what do we work in? We work in Alaska, Arizona, Montana, Nevada, New Mexico, Oklahoma, South Dakota, Alabama, and Washington State. And uh, so our team, you know, I'm, I'm actively recruiting uh, Native American natural resource graduates, professionals. So. Uh, you know, I want to use them more like consultants to, to work with the tribes because what we see with the tribes is a lot of their natural resource programs, their wildlife programs, their range programs are starting to fade away and they're all being grouped and put underneath the EPA program because the EPA program is what usually gets funded regularly. So that kind of loses a little bit, you know, it takes away and it kind of dilutes everything, I think. But, um, you know, working with them, we can, we can still get quite a bit done. And this is a list of my staff uh, and then our district coordinators. Uh, kind of went over that already. And so uh, at this point, I'm taking the question. Um, do you have any um, plans to work with the urban Native American population that don't necessarily have access to land? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. We, we've been talking about that. I got to uh, visit uh, the inner city of Detroit like three, two, two years ago and saw how they were doing their, their gardens within the inner city. And where we were staying at was an Airbnb, and you could really see that the whole neighborhood was empty. So, you know, there's some huge issues going on there. But, um, yeah, we got to, we can't forget our, our relatives that did move to the, to the cities throughout the nation. They were placed there in the, you know, after World War II to have a successful life. And, you know, it, it's funny you mention that because there was a guy here working at the hotel that told me that he was a Navajo. His dad was a Navajo that relocated up here like in the 50s to work on the railroad and, and they never went home. <laughs> so uh, it's pretty, pretty neat. But yeah, we do want to eventually uh, reach out to the Native American communities. We, there's, uh, there's a lot in, uh, you know, Portland, uh, Denver, Albuquerque, uh, Phoenix, Oklahoma City. So uh, there is opportunities there too. Any other? How large, how large will your, uh, are you kind of proposing these conservation districts to be, or um, what's, what's the size of, the, of each of those? Well, the biggest uh, tribe we're working with right now is Navajo, it's 17.5 million acres. And uh, there's six conservation districts within the, the tribal nation. They also have uh, ranch lands on the outside, which consists of 1.5 million acres of ranch land off the reservation. So these are, you know, some of these have pretty substantial amount of uh, acreage. You know, uh, and so the question is, are we trying to regreen that area? But right now, Navajo Nation 
supposedly has over 65,000 head of cattle and over 70,000 head of wild horses. And that turns into a cultural issue where, you know, our elders really believe that, you know, these, these, uh, these animals, uh, the, the horses help, uh, you know, got us where we are today. But they're also very spiritual. And I was explaining this to Sean Kelly earlier. Um, you know, they always tell us, you pick up a hoof, there's an arrowhead on the bottom of the hoof, which they're referring to the frog. <laughs> and the, the horse has, has, has four feet, and when it runs, you know, and there's four directions, so there's a, <laughs> there's a lot of connections there. I mean, there's an opportunity for horse slaughter units on, on our tribal nations, but, you know, we, there's some cultural issues that have to be ironed out. So I don't know, I, I, I can see both sides of the argument. But uh, yeah, we are. So in order us, for us to regreen it, like you said, we got to get down to changing our policies. And, yeah, policies. Right now, they let the local grazing man look over his area, and most of the time that local grazing man is a family member or, you know, politically he doesn't want to commit suicide, you know, to, to enforce any of these grazing regulations. And then on top of that, you know, we, the BIA has done a bad uh, job of succession and transition planning with our grazing permits. So a lot of them are tied up with our grandparents. And there's 16 of us utilizing that one resource, which will come to try to be a common situation. So, you know, until we figure out how to get that all updated and, and change, then that's going to be a And then COVID hit and, and, and took away. And, and the weirdest thing was we were paying them $18 yeah, an hour. Yeah, that's an hour. That was $20 an hour. But just like on the outside, you have people who want to work for their age. It's kind of scary. At that, that age, I was going to high school, I was going to $50 an hour. <laughs> Uh, one of the other questions that I got uh, prior to this is, you know, uh, there's a lot of interest in working in tribes, and there's a lot of interest in uh, partnering with them, the grant money. So our tribal administrations, they turn over pretty quickly, you know, due to politics or, you know, somebody's holding a grudge or nepotism, you know. So it, there's a lot of turnover. So. People say, well, I wrote the tribe, I wrote the tribe, they won't return my calls, they won't. But, you know, until you get somebody like uh, Inca to work with, and we, you know, we can get, uh, communicate to them at a different level, you know, that's when I'm hoping that, you know, organizations like ours can help with that communication. Because, uh, you know, the synergy can be built, it can be huge, you know. And uh, I, I really believe that, you know, at one time we were restricted to borders, but now it's all blending in again. Because at one time the border towns used to live in the land of the Irish community, and now it's in the district of the Irish community. Any other questions? Um, have you been following the potential progress of the American No, but I have one of our employees sitting in on a Native American uh, Fish and Wildlife uh, conference right now that I was going to go to, but he's sitting in and he's, he's giving well, me feedback of where we're going. So we're trying to address you know, the whole holistic view of it, you know, wildlife, um, fire management, agriculture, you know, conservation. So um, if there's opportunities there that you guys would like to... Partner with with our organization. Oh,